Uh, uh, today I, I want to speak uh, on the crucifixion of what Christ went through on our behalf. And uh, I'll start and read the section, uh, Matthew 27, first of all. And that's verses 27 to 61. Verses 27 to 61. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted the crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And of course, it was a rod. It wouldn't have been a reed you would pull up from a swampy area or something like that. It was a piece of wood. And struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now as they come out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they'd come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of his skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he wouldn't drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then the two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and the elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the King of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, This man calls for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone, let us see if Elijah will come and save him. Jesus, when he had cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks split. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, uh, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Uh, verse 57, Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea called, named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. And when Jesus had taken the body, when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. 
it is a horrific thing to, to read what Jesus went through. And uh, what's so, uh, what grabs you about a lot of this is that it's the incredible act of solidarity with us in God becoming a human being, setting aside his divinity as we read in Philippians 2. And not uh, when he become, becomes a man, he doesn't use anything relating to his divinity to help him. He lives as we live, lives as we live. Uh, and uh, he didn't need, in doing this, he didn't need to sort of add anything to himself because God is complete and fulfilled as it is. But he merged his own divinity, his own essence with humanity and took on our flesh. Uh, he experienced hunger, cold, weariness, had to rest at times. Remember they were crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat and the stormy and was fast asleep on a pillow. You can think of the, the energy he expended all through his ministry and those that during that three and a half years. He felt sorrow, desire, pain, and death, of course, the ultimate death. And he triumphed over death. He triumphed over it. Uh, uh, going through it the way any human being would have to go through it in the sense of suffering the pain in, in a human body. Messy business of that. He went through that. And yet, he leads us, he calls us, he strengthens us when we're down, lifts us up again, and he shows us the way to do the same as he did. To put aside, yeah, when we encounter difficulties and we have weaknesses which we have to strive to overcome, and he gives us the strength to overcome those. He does, he does. Them. And throughout his Gospel account, Matthew illustrated how the incarnate Son of God is our King is our king, and he was moved by compassion for the human condition. In Matthew 23, 37, Matthew 23, and 37, remember, uh, he was on his way there, let's see, and he says, you remember he cried out over Jerusalem, he said, Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often, notice this, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing to see your house is left to you desolate. See the, the, the emotion that was in that statement? There was Jerusalem rejecting him, not listening, not believing him, seeing the <clears throat> wonderful miracles he performed, and accusing him of, of do, casting out demons through the prince of the demons. I mean, any rational human being you would think would, seeing things like that, what he did, would bow down before him, worship him. And he was fully human as well as divine. He, he got hungry. Now remember in Matthew 4, talks about the temptation, uh, Satan tempted him. And of course, after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. He was hungry. I don't need to turn there, but... And he, he, he found time to be alone. He had to go off and he... There was one occasion when he had... Uh, he had fed the, the multitude and, and so forth, and he knew that they wanted to take him and make him king. And he went off, got out of the road. He didn't, he wasn't there. It wasn't that sort of kingdom. He wasn't going to be like some of the, those following him. He wasn't going to be a, sort of a Christ who led them against the Romans. And there were many false Christs. There were many of them. Some of the Maccabees uh, did uh, cleanse the temple and all before Christ's time. They, they had to deal with, I think it was uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, one of Alexander the Great's generals who ruled the northern part of Palestine there. And he de 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 desecrated the temple. And the Maccabees uh, he rose up against them and, and drove them out. But those following were actually put to death, and that was the end of it. 
That was the end of it. There were others who, uh, Simon Bar Kokhba was one, and he was, the Romans knocked, got him out of the road very quickly. And his followers, they searched them all out too. And that was after Christ's time, of course. Yes, you can see the emotion uh, that Jesus felt in Matthew 23 there. Fully human he was, and he felt that. He was hungry. He found time to be alone. He went out to pray on his own to the top of a mountain. And in his account of the crucifixion, Matthew stresses the suffering of Jesus. How he was taken away forcibly by Roman troops who were there as the garrison. Probably a cohort of about 600 soldiers. He was stripped, dressed in a scarlet robe, had a crown of thorns thrust painfully on his head. Just imagine that. They found this golden uh, something they think might be related to the crown of thorns. There's a, they find many things like shrouds and all the rest of it which they're spurious. They're not genuine at all. And why would uh, God who to tells people not to worship idols or things, why would those things be re relevant to our worship? So uh, yeah, he had that thrust onto his head, mocked in derision, oh yes, you're the king, and bowing down before him. I don't, <clears throat> probably we don't fully grasp the effect and the pressure of that sort of mocking and derision on a human being, especially when there's a large group of people doing it. If you're in the crowd of people, and all baying for your blood, and mocking you and saying, oh, you were to do this, you're the king of the Jews, and you saved others, but come on, come on down from the cross. Terrible. They mocked him, they spat on him, and they, they treated him with utter contempt. Utter contempt. They struck him repeatedly on the head. As I mentioned, it wasn't a reed, it was a, a rod. And imagine that coming down on your head and the crown of thorns there being hammered into your skull, more or less. And of course, uh, then they dressed him in his own clothes again and dragged him away to be crucified. And uh, it does say in Hebrews 2, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, Fourteen and fifteen of Hebrews two. <clears throat> Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he give, does give aid to the seed of Abraham. So brethren, he, he took on our flesh. He wasn't going to take any easy way through, just wave his hand and antagonists disappear and that sort of thing. Nonsense. He suffered as a human being would suffer. And of course, um, the cross was regarded as the most horrible and most degrading form of punishment. Uh, the Roman lawyer and philosopher Cicero whom you would have heard of, wrote uh, that it was a most cruel and disgusting punishment. It debased a human being. <coughs> Excuse me. What uh, in modern times uh, they have discovered during times of war and even apart from times of war that one of the ways to deal with a person if you want information from them and you're, you, that torture is one of them of course is to make them a non-person. The Germans did that with the Jews. The Nazis, rather, did it with the Jews uh, in the 30s. They made them non-persons. And they dragged them out and had nothing, and hardly the clothes they stood up in, and sent them off in trains, like cattle trucks and so forth. You make them a non-person, and then you don't have any feelings towards them. And you, can, you treat them any way you want. And it's a horrible thing. 
And the crucifixion is like that, the way they treated Jesus. Um, and sometimes the protracted agony of the victims lasted for days. Uh, the eventual death would be caused by, the, obviously pain would be a big factor. There would there'd be the hunger and thirst side of it as well. And after what Jesus went through being scourged uh, and the humiliation at the hands of the Roman soldiers, Matthew records that in his physical weakness he struggled even to carry his own cross. The, the, the cross piece, the victim would have to carry that to the place of crucifixion. And Jesus struggled to do that because of what he had gone through. Because the scourging itself, uh, there were pieces of bone and metal and all in the thongs that would come from that type of whip. And that there was horrific. That was even thinking about it, really horrific. So they, they as it, we read in Matthew 27, a passerby, Simon of Serene, was made to help him on his way to Golgotha. And uh, it is suggested that Simon later became a Christian, in fact. Uh, as Jesus, uh, helped by Simon, of course, carried that cross, part of the cross, he even comforted those who were weeping for him. He said, don't weep for me. Luke 23, Luke 23, and I think it's verse 28, 28. Yeah, he, he, let's see now. As they led him away, verse 26, as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. A lot of people did think Jesus was a good man and thought he was the Messiah. They mourned and lamented, but Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they'll say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore. And that was, he was prophesying what was going to happen when the rebellion in 70 AD occurred. And at that, they destroyed Jerusalem and the people were sent off into captivity, etc. And yeah, he felt for the people. And he saw they just had turned, they, their minds were closed anything he had said, and he knew they wouldn't listen. But, yeah, he, he did comfort them, and then, uh, of course, as we read, he refused to drink the wine that was mingled with gall. And uh, it was a concoction that helped to dull the pain of people being crucified. But he, he was going to go through that with all his senses intact, his mind clear, and suffer to the utmost. He wasn't going to relieve that suffering in any way. He wasn't going to do that. And uh, the, the effect of that, it sort of stupefied and dulled the nervous system so that you didn't feel the full impact of the pain. And Jesus, he endured the full scope of the pain. And his mental faculties were unimpaired. They weren't affected because he hadn't drank the, the concoction. And he died, of course, for all of us, not just for us, for every human being who ever lived. And some of them are going to be amazed at what God did for them when they never knew before. They never knew before. Nobody, they often, how often have we seen the truth hidden? Even the Bible, what struggles there were to, keep, to print that. Henry VIII and people, you were burned in Bloody Mary, they called her. She was one of Henry's daughters, as you know. Uh, if you were caught to the Bible, Bibles were burned and you were probably burned as well. That's the way it was. And they'll be amazed, people will be amazed when, in the general resurrection, when they see what God really is offering. And people who never heard of Christ, never knew anything of it. What God's offering to them? Will they refuse it, do you think? Will they refuse to repent? The executioners had rights, of course, to the victim's clothes, and they cast lots for what Jesus uh, was wearing. Uh, in Psalm 22, Psalm 22.
Psalm 22 and uh, in verses 1 and 2, uh, Christ is saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning. And here he was in the middle of that pain and there, he didn't seem to sense God's presence. And he, he says, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, I'm not silent. And then, in, uh, moving over the page here, let me see now where have I got to. Oh yes, 14, verse 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. He was hanging there on the cross. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, and Roman troops. The assembly of the wicked has enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So that's what they did. And that, there was no, crucifixion was not used in Israel. And way back when the, that psalm was inspired, it wasn't crucifixion, there was no crucifixion. So here was a forecast of what was actually happening. They cast lots for the, the robe he wore was seamless, and they couldn't tear it or do anything with it, they divide it. So they cast lots for that, that robe, and one of them obviously got it. And you can imagine what uh, some modern people would do if they thought they had the robe. There is a film called The Robe. I'm sure you've seen it years ago. I can't remember who the main actors were in that. <laughs> ah, he was in it, that's right, The Fisherman. Yes, that's right. So uh, it's interesting. Um, let's see now. Yes. He, Christ is praying and he, had, he may have been going over this psalm in his mind, uh, but he, he obviously may not have felt God's presence initially. But then uh, in verse 20 and 21, in uh, verse 19, You, O Lord, do not be far from me, O my strength hasten to help. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Yeah, God did answer him. He made his presence known to Christ. And it's interesting, back to back with the Psalm 22, is Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Yeah, the, yeah, they split up his foes and those who watched him die, even the rebels who were crucified with him. They were mocking him as well. And of course the chief priests and teachers of the law, they were glad to get rid of him. Oh yes, he was a danger, a threat. He was seen as a threat. They didn't know what was going to happen in three days, of course. And they continued to heap insults on him as we read. Uh, come down from the cross, you know, king of the Jews. You're not so great now, you're stuck up there, come down. And a comparison of the gospel account sheds light on the various phrases that Jesus spoke on the cross. Uh, and one of the details that Matthew records is of a, a soldier who presumably out of compassion maybe soaked a sponge in sour wine. This was, the, the soldiers drank this sour wine because it would have been dangerous. They were on the move a lot and it might have been dangerous to drink the water. So they drank this sour wine. Apparently it used to be the same in London, way back in the Middle Ages. The water, there was cholera happening quite regularly, and it came from the water. So a lot of the people drank sour wine. And it wasn't the most perfect wine. You, a, a connoisseur would not call it a good wine. It, and of course, uh, in John 19, 28, we can see that. John 19. 
And uh, <clears throat> after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, this verse 28, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he meant his goal, his aims were completed. He had paid the price of sin. He had conquered death. He hadn't risen at this stage, <clears throat> but he had defeated those who really Satan. Behind the chief priests and behind Pilate, and there were the, <clears throat> the figures, they were just used by Satan. Behind them was Satan, and Satan was defeated. So I wonder, did Satan really know of the resurrection, that he had been resurrected? Maybe he thought that he had conquered there at that time. Maybe he did. Yeah, the soldiers drank that, and <clears throat> after committing himself to God, Jesus died voluntarily for our salvation. Paid the price of sin. Um, as we, for the joy, as we can quote, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. He, and of course in Hebrews 12, verse 2, Hebrews 12, verse 2, There is the exhortation in verse 1 to us that there are a great crowd of witnesses watching us and, and like in a race they're egging us on, you know, go on, you're going to make it. And we'll read this verse 1, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God, of God's throne. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, Jesus did succeed, he conquered. Jesus, the Emmanuel, which translated means God with us, Matthew 1 23. Uh, when the <coughs> Gabriel visited Mary, he was telling her what he'd be named. Matthew 1, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear us a child, and uh, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So even at the cross, you know, uh, that's the individual who is there bearing our sin. And of course for us, uh, the cross represents the perfection of God's love that was poured out for us. It was, his love, his mercy was poured out for us. And it also uh, represents sort of the sacrificial logic of Israel's Day of Atonement. Where the high priest made the sacrifice for himself and then for the people. And it was to make themselves right with God, but it was pointing to Jesus who was going to do that. And he did it. Jesus did it. And it was all love for us. Yeah, you know, do you remember the time uh, when they were receiving the Ten Commandments? And uh, they started worshipping golden calves, etc. And God said, I think I'll wipe them out and raise up a people from you to Moses. And Moses said, no, don't do that, because the Egyptians will laugh, you laugh to scorn and say, this God of theirs took them out to kill them. See the humility of Moses there. See the humility. Yeah, it's absolute love for human beings that God has. Absolute love. And you can't measure it. You cannot measure it. And as we read Matthews and the other accounts, we may think that 
the Roman and Jewish authorities had complete control of the situation there, but they didn't. They didn't have. Because we have to remember the plan and the purpose of God in all this. And in Colossians 2, Colossians 2, and verse 15, and we read there, uh, First of all, verse 14, 15, uh, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, in other words, our sins, and nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Tri triumphing over them in it. So, you know, God's purpose was being worked through there, no matter what the Jewish authorities thought they were doing or uh, they might have thought they were winning the situation. So the spiritual, spiritual reality is that the grace of God reigns supreme. Uh, and it did at the cross. When Jesus gave up his spirit, uh, it, it's a note of victory for him and for us. It is finished, he said. It is finished. And thus we can join Paul and we can declare with Paul in Galatians 2.20, Galatians 2.20 Yes, Paul says here, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So each of us can that's for us individually, and for everyone, of course. Everyone individually. Yeah, we participate, of course. We participate, and, uh, and we're part of those who belong to Christ Jesus. Uh, and we crucify the flesh, brethren. We battle. There is a scripture... We don't battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and the powers of this world. And the powers, the real powers of this world, is Satan and his demons. And they influence all the evil that takes place. And people fall before their temptations and think it's great, they're living the good life. Buy an island here and that's great. Or there. Just think of what's in front of us, brethren. A new earth, new heavens, a body that doesn't get sick, don't have to go to the doctor, no tablets to take, you don't get tired anymore, don't need a good night's sleep. Yeah, we have to crucify the flesh, and it isn't against, it's against demons that we battle, and the things that they conjure up. And sometimes they try to resurrect a part of our human nature that maybe we were weak in, we gave in to. And they try to resurrect that. We may be in a situation where we're a slight to you know, remind us of what we were maybe in the past, and then they'll say, oh, that's nice, isn't that good? You could enjoy that. We battle against thoughts like that. We're told to bring every thought into captivity. In Corinthians, I think it's Corinthians. But Matthew records uh, that after the betrayal of Jesus in the garden, he's led about it to trial, of course, as we read. And false witnesses came forward, remember, to reinforce the accusations that were against him. And the religious leaders accused Jesus of blasphemy. And the high priest, Jesus wasn't really answering, and then he said, I abjure you by the living God, and if, if you were abjured like that, you had to answer, in a sense. But Jesus did answer, said, you have said it. And in the future you'll see the Son of Man coming in power and in glory. And he said, what need we have any more witnesses? And he tore his garment, and that trial was illegal. It should not have taken place at night at all. And the full Sanhedrin should have been there, and it wasn't. So, you know, the way they went about this, and they, 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 they sort of 
monitoring the law and telling people how they should keep it. They had, they had that many rules about the law that people couldn't even understand what the law was supposed to say. <sighs> yeah, <clears throat> the way they went on, they sp spat at him and then beat him up more or less as well before he ever went to Pilate. And all the things that did to him, really sickening, really sickening. And then they brought him to Pilate. He offered to release Jesus from Barabbas. There's something I was wondering. Was it the same crowd who were hiding for Jesus' blood that night? Was it the same crowd that were there when he entered Jerusalem and put palms down? Or would those people have maybe retired for the night? You see, no one knew this trial was going on at night. No one knew that. Was this a crowd drummed up by the Pharisees themselves? It could, very likely was. And then people woke up in the morning and began to hear news that Jesus was actually dead, dying or dead on the cross. It's interesting. But you know, oh, how could they live for themselves? Did an inkling of the truth ever seep into some of their brains? Did it? And then, of course, Pilate, <laughs> bring me a basin of water. I am innocent of the death of this just person. If he was just, why was he putting him to death? Why was he handing him over to be killed? I, I think Pilate's wife went to him and said she dreams about this man. And, you know, warned him, but he didn't, he, he was shred by the cry. He was afraid of a, of a negative report going back to Caesar. And Caesar would have removed him. But someone else said, all politics. And we have plenty of politics with nothing been done by those who are supposed to be politicians. But anyway, Pilate passed it over to the chief priests and all that. I mean, Jesus flogged and handed over, as we know. And then Joseph Arimathea, member of the San Sanhedrin, who had not consented to Christ's death. He had not. He probably wasn't there. And uh, he petitioned Pilate for the body. And Pilate was amazed that Christ would have been dead so soon. And he had it checked out with the centurion. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know what that is, a frog or something. And uh, then, of course, uh, the Pilate released the body and he is assisted by Nicodemus in taking it down from the cross. And surprised to hear, as I said, that he was dead. And then the centurion, summoning him, he said, hand the body over. And strictly speaking, Jesus had no right to an honourable burial. Uh, his body should have been put in a place reserved for convicted criminals. And Joseph, Joseph, uh, a righteous man, had another plan, of course, and he took it, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, as we know, and put some spices in, no doubt, there, and placed it in his own new tomb, never used, never used. And he had got it cut out of the rock and rolled a big stone in front of it. And then, in John 20, John 20, verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb when it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the stone, from the tomb. <clears throat> so the sun's beginning to shine, brethren, after the dark night and after the darkness of Christ's crucifixion. She ran and came to Peter and told him, and they made their way back there. Uh, and of course, uh, Simon Peter came following John and went into the tomb and Simon as usual running in boldly and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloth but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first, who, that was John, went in also and he saw and believed. But what? Why did he believe? Those clothes had collapsed on themselves. Christ just rose out of them. They weren't unwrapped. They weren't unwrapped. Christ got up 
rose out of them. John believed when he saw that. John believed. For yet they didn't know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. But yet he believed. <laughs> then the disciples went away to their own homes. Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she went, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And there were two angels there, of course, verse 12. And they said, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said, Because they've taken away my Lord. She thought he had been stolen or taken away. And I do not know where they've led him. And when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Now this, the hairs would rise on the back of her neck. Reading this, Stephen. And did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've led him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, and this is typical of the love and concern Jesus has for everyone, Mary. And she knew, she turned and said, Rabboni. She knew right away who it was with his voice. And Jesus said, don't cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary came and told the disciples, of course, that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. And then the apostles were all together uh, in the evening, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut and the disciples were assembled, notice for fear of the Jews. What happened after a supposed Messiah died was they hunted his followers. That's what they did. And they would have been looking for these guys. They would have been looking for them. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said, Peace be to you. And they, were, they, they couldn't, they didn't know who it was. Right? They were shocked. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said, Peace be to you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain the sins of many, they're retained. Thomas wasn't there, of course. And we know that after, in verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside. Thomas there too. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst. Peace be to you. And he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here. Look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas, Thomas didn't do it. Because he, how did he get through the wall? The door was locked. The wall was solid. Thomas didn't do it. Jesus said, Thomas, no, Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. And this, brethren, listen to this. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So there was the victory. Christ was raised from the dead. And we can rejoice in that. We can rejoice in that. And, you know, it, it carries us through when we're up tight against a wall. Sometimes we are. And we don't know how maybe we can get out of it. But God sees us through. So there's plenty to think about. Yes, the suffering happened, the horrible things happened, but it was for a tremendous purpose. And that was caused by the love for us, for all humanity, all the races that there are that God created, whether they're in China or India or wherever, black, yellow, white, God's love embraces them all. And his arms are wide, his arms are wide. And he hugs us. It's funny about a hug, isn't it? Warmth in it. There's love in it. So brethren, don't let any negative things get you down because it's all waiting on us and Christ is going to be meeting us.